Do you see that dot? No, not that one. Yes, that one. The medium-sized one. That's one of 10 billion stars in the Milky Way. The Milky Way, that's the name we've given our galaxy, and it's one of billions of galaxies in the known universe. Astronomers at Yale study a huge range of topics about our universe. It's beginning in the Big Bang, how the first stars and galaxies formed, and the life and death of stars. But one star in this ocean of stars, one tiny speck of light, attracts the most attention. It's the one we call our sun. To us, the sun looks like a quiet yellow ball of glowing gas. Let's take another look. If you use eye protection and look at the sun closely, you might see dark regions on its surface called sunspots. These sunspots are cool areas on the sun's surface, and the largest spots seen here are bigger than the Earth. The yellow sunlight we see comes from the outer parts of the star, which has a temperature of about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. But some areas of the sun's atmosphere are much hotter, and they can only be seen in ultraviolet or X-ray light. We can't see these wavelengths of light with our eyes, but a telescope in space can. The SOHO spacecraft is a very important tool for studying the sun at wavelengths beyond what the human eye can see. These pictures of the sun's atmosphere reveal hot, glowing flares around each sunspot. Every 11 years or so, the sun goes through a cycle of having almost no spots to lots of spots, called the solar activity cycle. The sun went through its last sunspot maximum in 2001, and it is currently in a quiet period in its cycle. The solar activity cycle has been linked to the climate on Earth, and an unusually long quiet period can mean trouble. Between 1650 and 1700, the sun had almost no spots, and the earth went through a mini ice age. Paintings from this time show frozen rivers in parts of Europe where rivers do not normally freeze. Understanding variations on the sun is one of the keys to understanding the climate on earth. Sunspots can also affect our increasing technological world in a way that did not affect people before the 19th century. The magnetic fields around sunspots can trap gas into huge bubbles that are suddenly released and expand outward. These coronal mass ejections can release billions of tons of matter, traveling at millions of miles per hour. Luckily, the Earth's magnetic field protects us from most of the dangerous radiation, but we still see some effects of the geomagnetic storm. Coronal mass ejections cause the beautiful northern lights, but they can also damage satellites, knock out radio communications and cell phones, and cause power outages. They can also be dangerous to astronauts living on the space station. Being able to predict coronal mass ejections will allow us to prepare in advance for such events. Dr. Sarbani Basu is an astronomer at Yale trying to understand and predict the sun's variations. One of the most important techniques she uses is called helioseismology. So helioseismology is the study of sunquakes. And what we do is use the sunquakes to probe what happens inside the sun. Hit a bell, you get a sound out, and the sound, the frequencies of the sound, the tone basically, depends on how big the bell is, what is the bell made of. And that's exactly what we do in the case of the sun. We, we look at the frequencies which, which the sun quakes, and we work backwards to find out what the sun is made up of, what, what is it doing? I mean, how is it rotating inside? From helioseismic studies, Dr. Basu and her colleagues have a very detailed knowledge of the sun's structure. For example, the center of the sun is a whopping 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. It is also extremely dense, more dense than lead. 
However, the immense temperature means that the material inside the sun still behaves like a fluid. They have also found that the solar activity cycle causes changes in the sun's rotation and its outer layers. Dr. Basu is now trying to understand these processes well enough to predict these changes that will affect the rest of the solar system. The first six planets in the solar system have been known for all time. Mercury, Venus, we all know our planet Earth, the third from the Sun. Mars, Jupiter and Saturn have been known throughout history since they can easily be seen by the naked eye. The casual stargazer might mistake them for bright stars, but the earliest astronomers noticed that over many nights the planets move across the sky while the stars remain in place. In modern history, three new planets have been discovered. Uranus in 1781, Neptune in 1846, and the dwarf planet Pluto in 1930. But is it possible that more planets are out there? Dr. David Rabinowitz is an astronomer at Yale who is helping to find out. Several years ago, we here at Yale built one of the world's largest digital cameras. Now, when you go to a store and buy a digital camera, you get something that's handheld, and that has a resolution of something like three or four megapixels. But our camera here at Yale is 100 times bigger than what you can buy at a store and has 160 megapixels. It covers an area on the sky much larger than any other telescope or any other camera ever built. Dr. Rabinowitz and his colleagues took these three pictures in October 2003, and from them they discovered a new object a hundred times farther from the Sun than the Earth. Stars are so far away that they stay still in the pictures, but something in our solar system will move. And based on how fast it moves, they can also tell how far away it is. Can you spot the object moving here? It is slightly larger than the dwarf planet Pluto, and it is so far from the Sun that it takes 560 Earth years for one complete orbit. Pluto only takes about 250 years. The International Astronomical Union has chosen the name Eris for this new discovery. But this is not the only new discovery. Dr. Rabinowitz also helped discover Sedna, an object about three-fourths the size of Pluto, and another object that they call Santa because it was discovered around Christmas in 2003. Hundreds of objects have been discovered beyond Neptune's orbit. This group is known as the Kuiper Belt. When Pluto was first discovered by Clyde Tombaugh in 1930, that was the only thing out there. He was looking for the first new object beyond new Neptune, and it was a spectacular discovery, and it was well deserved to be called a new planet at the time. But since that time, and more recently in the last 10 years, we've discovered that Pluto is actually embedded in a huge belt of smaller bodies, and we call these Kuiper Belt objects. So Pluto is part of a much larger population, and that's why astronomers today have decided that Pluto really belongs to this population, this belt, rather than it does to the larger planets. And we think that this is the beginning of a new population of objects, which we call dwarf planets, and we think there'll be a lot more surprises as we continue our search. What's so important about the rubble that makes up the Kuiper Belt? These are not solar system rejects. They are actually a very important key to life on Earth. These frigid worlds are made of a mixture of rock and water ice. We still see a few Kuiper Belt objects near the sun today. They are called comets. When the solar system was young, there were many more comets than there are today, and the Earth got bombarded by millions of them. These comets crashed into the newly formed planet, delivering ice that melted during the giant impacts. And since the Kuiper Belt objects are covered with organic material, they probably brought with them many of the molecules that we are made of. Eventually, oceans formed on the Earth, the bombardment slowed to a trickle, and the surface of the planet calmed down. Life began to form.